can, yes. Excellent. Okay. So thanks, Monica. Um, as Monica said, my name is Sean Dunn. Uh, I'm the natural heritage zoologist for the Nebraska Game and Parks Commission. Uh, within the commission, I'm in the wildlife division. And then we've got a, a group of researchers, biologists uh, in a section called RAI, which is uh, research analysis and inventory. Uh, under RAI, I'm in a group called the Natural Heritage Program. Uh, every uh, state and province in North America, including Canada, um, has a natural heritage program, including some uh, down into uh, Central and South America as well. Um, and very broadly, uh, just to sum it up, uh, natural heritage programs are here to gather data on our native species and try to keep track of them. Um, I'm kind of mixing programs here, but we want to keep our common species common. Uh, and so when a, a species starts declining, we try to keep track of them. We try to find out what's going on. Uh, and we provide those data um, at individual levels that can then be used at a larger scale to figure out trends and to find out what's going on. So broadly, that's kind of what, um, what I do. But we'll go through this. Um, so today, uh, we'll talk about my education, uh, where I got my, my formal education and what I was working towards, um, my experience, what I do at Game and Parks, uh, where I work in Nebraska, uh, some current projects that we have going on, and some things I wish I knew when uh, I was working to become a biologist that, um, that I think might be helpful. Uh, one thing I want to note is uh, you can see the asterisks here on the I. I, I just want to know that I don't do anything alone. Um, I, I'm saying I for ease here, um, I or we, but I have a lot of other biologists that work at Game and Parks that know their areas a lot better than me, or they know certain species a lot better than me. And I call on them all the time to help me out. Um, as you'll see, you know, I'm responsible for kind of keeping track of, of several large taxa within the state. And so um, it's never just me doing it. Um, it's certainly other biologists at Game and Parks um, and other species specialists across the state and in the Great Plains um, that uh, I work with. And also, if anybody's squeamish, um, I do have a couple of pictures of, of dead animals and um, some slightly um, bloody things. So just take note of that. So diving right in, uh, my education, formal education, uh, began with my um, BS from University of Central Missouri, um, which used to be called Central Missouri State University. But my major was in biology. My minor was fire science. Uh, that fire science is actually structural, not uh, wildland or prescribed burning or anything like that. But there was a lot of crossover in some of the information. So um, that was nice. My, I did participate in some undergraduate research, which if you are interested in becoming a biologist, zoologist, wildlife biologist, veterinarian, whatever it may be, I, I cannot stress enough the uh, importance and the benefit to you of doing some undergrad research. Um, I'll, I'll talk about it a little bit here, but um, the scientific method is very important and that using it at that level uh, at the undergrad is, is hugely beneficial for you. So I, I cannot stress that enough. If, if there are projects, if there's a way to get involved, um, talk to your advisor. That's something I, I really encourage you to do. Um, so after I graduated, I took what I like to call a two-year sabbatical. Um, I was working, doing some field, um, field work, uh, working on various projects. Uh, also, anytime I was um, in an area long enough, I was taking classes to get ready for my master's, uh, which I did at Fort Hayes State University. Um, again, my master's was in biology with an emphasis in conservation and biogeography. Uh, my master's research uh, focused on crabid beetles as indicators in grasslands. You know, and at this time, you know, growing up, I, I at first I wanted to be a herpetologist. Uh, then I went to, to be an ornithologist, then a mammologist, uh, then an entomologist. 
Um, and by the time I got to my master's, you know, I had, I had run the gamut and, you know, my paradigm kind of shifted from focusing solely on one taxa uh, that I wanted to be an expert into um, really focusing on the question at hand. So, you know, what question were we trying to answer and then what taxa could best answer that question. So, um, so that kind of changed over time. And that's when I kind of realized um, it, I don't need a specific taxa, you know, uh, to, to be an expert in. And, um, and certainly I'm, I'm not an expert in any taxa, but um, I know enough about uh, enough things to be dangerous. So, uh, so a little bit about my experience. These are just kind of the highlights, um, but I wanted to give you a, a you know, kind of a, a range of things that I've done, uh, been involved with. And I will say, you know, a lot of these things, these were not being done when I was uh, being uh, paid for any kind of specific job. A lot of these are, I was volunteering on a project or another grad student was doing something and, and they uh, were in the same location as me. And so I said, okay, I get done at, you know, five o'clock with this or, you know, three o'clock, let's go do your work after that. And then at night, you know, we can go driving, looking for herps and all of this. So, you know, being in the right place at the right time can be really helpful for some projects. Um, but I think the biggest thing that I, I would urge you to do when you're trying to get more experience is ask if you can help. That is a huge thing. Um, again, if you are um, in the same location as uh, another project and you just say, hey, do you need help doing this? Um, you know, do you need help taking notes? Uh, do you need help holding that bag while, you know, you do this? Um, just ask if you can help, even if you're just standing there um, watching what they're doing, you know, over time and they see you're dependable, you're good at following directions, um, they'll ask you to, to do more and more for the project. And so you can, you can get a lot of experience that way if you just um, ask if you can help, so. So what do I do um, specifically here in Nebraska? So I've got three main taxa that I uh, kind of cover. Uh, herptiles, so amphibians and reptiles, insects, and then small mammals. And so small mammals, bats, rats, voles, uh, shrews, you know, things that um, typically aren't uh, trapped by trappers and aren't hunted, uh, those kind of, uh, are the, the species that fall under uh, my purview. And then um, I will help out with other T and E species or tier one or tier two species, which are species of greatest conservation needs. So those are species that um, we've noticed declines in their populations and uh, whatever biologist is in charge of that, they may need some help. They may need uh, some guidance on uh, where to go or who to work with. And so um, at times I will help with um, other species, not in the three big groups that I work with. Um, now I've got this nature serve thing on here. Earlier I was talking about how um, all the states in uh, North America and provinces and some in Central and South America have uh, natural heritage programs. And what they do with those data is they all go into a, a database program uh, called Biotics that is run by NatureServe. And then NatureServe is able to take a look at those data from a larger scale. Um, so to really look at what's going on with species populations, um, hopefully throughout the entire range of that species. Uh, and so that's really useful. And so NatureServe is, is not always a group that you hear a lot about because they don't advertise themselves a whole lot, um, but they're the ones that provide a lot of data when decisions are getting made at a large scale about a lot of species. So when um, the US Fish and Wildlife Service says, uh, we're thinking about listing this species as endangered, what, what data are out there? Nature Serve is the first place to go. Um, they are the ones that take all of those data from the individual states and provinces and, and uh, put it all together in a way that you can make decisions with. So very important organization um, and that we work with uh, through the Game and Parks Commission. So 
what do I do on a day-to-day -day basis? Uh, I do a lot of email and phone calls. Um, a lot of people, I get questions on um, a lot of different things. Um, and I also do a lot of coordination with other agencies. Um, you know, I, almost half of, of my, my email is coordinating with other agencies, uh, federal agencies, state agencies, um, nonprofits, NGOs, um, because there's a lot of data out there that are, um, may have already been collected that we could use or that we have that these organizations can use. And so um, also if we are talking about working with an endangered species, obviously if it's federally endangered, that falls under Fish and Wildlife Service. So we have to coordinate with them with all the work we do. Um, so there's a lot of coordination and making sure that everybody knows what's going on um, and that we're keeping each other um, uh, abreast of what's going on and have the most current information, current data. Um, we hire contractors to do surveys. Certainly, again, I can't do uh, all of the surveys that I'd like to do. And there are species experts out there that know a lot more about some of these species than I do. So we hire them to do surveys because they're uh, much better at doing it and they can get the data into us a lot faster than I could. Um, we clean and submit data. So data that comes in from folks that are doing surveys. Um, also, you know, any surveys we do. Uh, I've got environmental sensors out right now for a project that um, are measuring um, temperatures and moisture. Um, and so I take those data, they, they collect data every half an hour. Um, and those have been running for several years. And so each year at the end of the year, I, I accumulate all the data from the year and condense it down so that uh, when we need it, it's there, it's ready to go. Um, and then I talk to landowners, obviously, if we're working on their property or we want to work on their property, we need to get their permission or they have questions for us about certain things. And I write grants. So, um, you know, we have a limited budget uh, within the agency. So sometimes we have to go outside of our agency budget to get funds. So, um, so that's something I do as well as is write grants. So just a couple examples of field work. Um, I find in Count Salt Creek tiger beetles, that's a, a common endangered species I talk about just because it, um, it's a federally endangered one. It's a cool beetle. I might be partial to it. So um, that's something I do. Use Sherman traps for looking for small mammals and prairies. Uh, document rare and unusual species, uh, investigate disease outbreaks. So uh, this is a good example. Uh, last year, uh, I got a call from a place that had some large barns. They knew they had bats in there. They were fine with that, but they were finding a lot of uh, bats on the ground and ones they thought they were dead. So um, we weren't sure what it could be. So I had to go out and take a look at how many bats were there, how many they were finding. Turns out everything was fine. It was just um, pup season and they were beginning to fly. And so a lot of them were, were on the ground, but um, everything was okay, and, and um, which was great. Um, picking up wayward snakes. Uh, sometimes I get calls from places. Um, I got a call from an office building one time and they said they found this snake. Uh, what did they want me to do with it? And I said, well, I, uh, I don't have it, so you guys can just release it. And they said, well, let me send you a picture. And so they sent me a picture of it and it was a snake from Mexico. So I said, please don't release that because we don't want um, that released into uh, in Nebraska. And so I went and picked that one up because they didn't know what to do with it. It probably would have ended up getting killed or um, just they probably would have just released it anyway. So uh, every now and then we do get, um, uh, odd animals that shouldn't be here. For instance, down here in the right-hand corner, you see uh, a civet. So we got a call that um, somebody had shot a civet that was uh, uh, attacking their chickens. And now another common name for a spotted skunk, uh, which I'll talk about here in a little bit, uh, is a civet cat. So I thought, oh, cool, someone uh, found a spotted skunk. This is great. We haven't seen many in Nebraska for a while. So I said, send me a picture and, and I'll confirm what it is and then we'll figure out what to do. And they sent me a picture of this animal. This is not native uh, to Nebraska, nowhere near uh, Nebraska. These are found in um, parts of Africa, 
India, um, Asia kind of continent. And um, definitely was, was likely someone's pet, I would say. And they probably released it when um, either it got out or they released it uh, when they couldn't care for it anymore. Um, and then uh, it was trying to have a nice meal of chickens and, and got shot. So um, these are the kind of things that pop up sometimes and we need to deal with. Um, we certainly don't want populations of these things in Nebraska. They probably wouldn't survive our winter, but, um, but nonetheless, we don't know what diseases they might be carrying that they could release to our native mammals. So um, we want to make sure that these kind of things are, um, are not frequent. Um, collecting ticks from deer. So obviously ticks carry a lot of diseases. So there's um, interest in uh, from different agencies, HHS, um, Department of Agriculture, to find out what species of ticks we have here and what diseases they're carrying. Um, identify species. I get a lot of herp pictures and insect pictures asking what, what they are. And then bio blitzes, I try to get involved with those as much as I can. So if you don't know, a bio blitz is where you go out uh, to a, an area and you spend one or two days there and try to document every single species that you can find. So plants, you know, animals, insects, everything. And so I work across the entire state. Um, like I mentioned in the beginning, you know, Game and Parks has a lot of really good biologists across the entire state. Um, and the first thing, if I get a question about something, a species that's out in the panhandle or something, I call our biologists out there to ask them, you know, what do you guys know about this? And uh, can you tell me where these populations are? Um, and if they know they're comfortable with that, then, you know, I may ask them to do some surveys for me if they have the time. If not, then I can travel out there and, and do that. But uh, certainly my work is, is across the entire state with the help of our um, Game and Parks biologists and uh, partner biologists and sometimes contractors. So some current projects we have going on. I mentioned spotted skunks earlier. Uh, this is a species we have not seen for um, a while in the state, um, with the exception of a few uh, records. Uh, we're working with the University of Nebraska Omaha. Um, we had a student interested in this, but they left the program. So uh, I think we have a new student now uh, set up to uh, run camera traps and track plates um, this summer, fall, and winter. Uh, we did get a state wildlife grant to fund this project, so that was great. That helps uh, out with all of the, um, the expenses. And hopefully, if we can find some spotted skunks, we're going to uh, analyze their habitat association so we can figure out, okay, if we do have populations left here in Nebraska, where are they going to likely be? And then we can do some targeted trapping in those areas and maybe follow up with some genetics uh, and a few other things in the future. Uh, and then also do some recommendations for um, uh, management to help their populations within the state. But this is a really cool species, um, has a really unfortunate decline. So I'm hoping that uh, we can find some uh, here in the next couple of years. Uh, the North American Bat Monitoring Program, also called NABAT, uh, this is a project actually run by um, U.S. Geological Survey, and we are partnering with the Nebraska Cooperative Fish and Wildlife Research Unit at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Um, we've got a biologist there that um, uses citizen or community science to help put up acoustic monitors across the state, and there's a lot of things we can do uh, with these data, um, but main things we're interested in are, um, you know, what do our uh, what species of bats do we have here? We have a pretty good idea, but it's always good to know exactly where we're picking them up in the state. Um, how common are they? Uh, where are they moving? When are they moving? Um, and so that's just some of the things that we can do uh, with these data that we're collecting under this program. And we actually partnered with uh, the state of Wyoming to do this. So we're helping fund their NABAT program uh, with the grant that uh, we have for this, um, for this program. 
And then of course, Salt Creek tiger beetle uh, recovery. Uh, I mentioned this earlier that I'm kind of partial to it. Um, this program, again, this is a, a state and federally listed species. And there are so many partners. Um, I listed some of the main ones, um, but we've got a lot more. There are so many people involved in this, um, but you know, not only are we um, uh, raising beetles in, uh, at zoos and at UNL for release, but we're also uh, doing a lot of restoration of saline wetlands. And you know, a lot of people are like, well, it seems like a lot of money for just a little bug, but you know, the, the, the beetle is just a small little piece of the project. I mean, uh, recovering and restoring the saline wetlands allows for so much of a greater use. Um, you know, it's really great for, uh, for hunters to go out and use those areas for hunting. Bird watchers um, have some really good luck at some of these saline wetlands because we get some really cool species in there. Um, we've got some native plants that uh, you will find only in certain areas of the saline wetlands. So, um, you know, it's not necessarily just about the beetle, although it's a really cool beetle. Um, we do have a lot of other tiger beetles that call the saline wetlands home. They're not tied to the wetlands as much as the Salt Creek tiger beetle. Um, but there's a lot of really cool species there. So um, I tell people, don't always focus on the beetle, but look at the really cool wetlands um, that we're able to restore because of that beetle. And so that's mostly what I do on kind of a day-to-day -day basis. And so now I'll just talk a, a little bit about some things I wish I knew when I was uh, getting into biology. And the first one is that the scientific method is, is more important than you think. So, you know, if, if you're a biology student, um, you know, you're going to be using the scientific method from now until um, you retire and then maybe beyond, depending on what kind of retirement activities you do. Um, but every step along the way is, is there to make sure that the data you're collecting, the project you're doing, follows that method so it's rigorous and so that those data are usable and defensible. And the last step that sometimes is left out of the scientific method is after you get done with your results, you publish those results or you talk about those results. You share those results with the scientific community. Um, and that's really important. So the scientific method, you're gonna hear about it again and again um, because I, I know it seems basic, but it's really, really important. And field work is awesome, right? Like that's why a lot of us got into biology because we want to take chances, you know, make mistakes, get messy, have fun in the field with animals. But uh, let me tell you, field work is sometimes awesome because sometimes you spend a lot of time getting things set up for some pitfall traps to collect insects. And then cows come along and they eat part of your traps or they kick your traps and stomp on them. And then all of your data is gone or you get a ground squirrel in your cup and he eats all your data, which was not fun. Um, had several of that, uh, several times that happened. Sometimes you're in a river in December or January looking for freshwater mussels and it's cold. And while the primary investigator is out looking for those mussels, um, you know, you're getting equipment ready, you're looking for mussels and it's freezing. Um, it's, it's uncomfortable. Um, or you're on a project where you're not wearing shoes a lot because you're in sand, it's easier to wear sandals or something and your feet are swollen and they're just dirty. And every time you wash them, you step out of the creek or the shower or whatever it may be. And then your feet are dirty again. Um, these are what people affectionately know as my hobbit feet um, because they look like this for months on end in the project uh, that I was on. But Field work is awesome. It, it can be. But my, I guess my point is, don't get discouraged when you're out there. Things are going to go wrong. Um, and it's, it's like 75% mental just being able to push through and keep doing what you're doing. Um, always volunteer to do the grunt work. Um, I, I've had several people I know that they become biologists and they think, well, yeah, I don't, I don't take notes at meetings anymore, or um, I, won't, I don't take trucks for oil changes or whatever it may be. 
um, or if if my project doesn't work out, um, I'm not going to go back through that data. That's that's for a temporary to do or something. It, no, it's not. Um, all of these steps are part of the scientific process, um, the scientific method, and need to be get done. Um, you know, if you are, um, no matter what it is, if you become really good at doing the basic stuff and you're dependable about it and you're really good at following directions, um, people, people realize that and they will start asking you to do more and more things. Um, it was just like I said, when, um, you know, when you volunteer and you're asking to help, if they just ask you to, to take notes, that's fine. Follow them around with a notebook and take notes, but take really good notes so they know, ah, you know what? That person was really good. They took the best notes I've had. They're going to remember that, I promise you. So um, don't skimp on the grunt work, even if it's just sitting there staring out looking for bears or again, taking notes or filling out vehicle logs or digging up, you know, soil probes that uh, need to be changed out. Um, all of that work is important, needs to get done. Um, health and safety. This is one that I didn't learn until I was in the field a lot. Um, and they don't teach this a whole lot, but it's, it's vitally important to what we're doing. Um, location, if you are isolated uh, in an area, you need to make sure you know uh, what to do in an emergency, uh, what to do in bad weather. If you need to evacuate, how are you evacuating? Um, as, as opposed to if you're in a cave, um, even if you're nearby someplace, what are the protocols to going into a bat cave? Um, you know, you want to make sure that you're not uh, spreading white nose syndrome, something that uh, we know about now. Uh, you want to make sure that uh, you've got the proper equipment on. Um, all of those kind of things. Equipment, you want to make sure that you're trained on equipment if you're going to be using something. I, I honestly know a uh, biologist that refused to read a, a manual of a piece of equipment um, because he thought, uh, I, I don't need that. I know how to work it. And he got written up for it. And uh, I, it was so simple. All he had to do was, was read a manual that would have helped you learn that piece of equipment. So um, again, make sure you're doing what you need to do. Uh, diseases and parasites. Now, as biologists, we are exposed to diseases, parasites, pathogens uh, that the general public may be exposed to way less frequently, right? We're getting exposed to these things weekly, daily, depending on what project you're working on. Hantavirus, rabies, Lyme, uh, giardia, malaria, histoplasmosis, um, all of these are things that you should know about. Um, for instance, on this project, we were working in caves, we were working in uh, barns. We had one barn that had a, a green room in it that uh, was maybe 10 foot by 10 foot jam-packed with, with bats all across the walls. Um, and there was probably 18 inches to two foot of guano uh, in the bottom and just soaked with bat urine. So you would open it up and this waft of ammonia would come out. Um, and we were in there for, you know, a couple minutes at a time, not very much, and we'd get out. Um, but uh, me and one other researcher ended up getting chemically induced pneumonia. Uh, from being in there with all that urine. Um, and so again, knowing protocols, knowing what's going on is, is really important. Uh, I've had malaria before. Luckily, I was in the States when the outbreak happened. So um, I had access to good health care. But the important thing is you need to be able to tell your doctor, look, I was in this place. I'm at risk for this and this and this. Uh, because they're not going to know that unless you tell them. And so it's really important to be up on um, what potential health risks you're at. Um, and then if you do get sick, you can explain that to your doctor. And then finally, uh, with people, you just got to make sure you trust the people you're with. So um, that's really important. If, if you're not trusting the people you're with, uh, you need to have a conversation with them. Uh, and make sure that, um, that you feel safe. Um, but we could do a whole lecture on health and safety for being in the field. Um, oh yes, and then of course, uh, so this was a, a scrape I got on the back of my leg that would not 
keel for like weeks on end, had to have an antibiotic, had to stop hiking so much. And finally it started closing up. Um, you know, luckily I was in a fairly isolated area, but we luckily had medicine um, that I could take. Um, but for instance, let's say you cut the side of your finger off. Um, that happened to me too. Um, so if I was in a really isolated area, that might be uh, something that's gonna send me home um, because the risk for infection would be so bad. So um, again, these are things you have to think about uh, based on your location, who are you with that could take care of you if you do get really sick and what is the risk for an infection and what do you plan to do about it? Okay, now this is a big one I hear people talk about and I had the same perception when I was uh, wanting to become a biologist, which is I like animals so much. I, I don't like people as much. And so um, I don't really want to talk to people, but guess what? You're likely going to be talking to a lot of people and that's okay. Um, because we really need to be talking to people. Talking to people about what you do is really important. Um, because again, the difference between just messing around and doing whatever and actual science is writing it down and then looking at the results and then publishing or talking about those results. Um, and again, that was totally me growing up. I, I wanted to work with animals. I didn't want to talk to people as much. And I have, you know, become a convert, if you will, and I always um, talk about how important it is to talk to people. Um, you know, last month I gave a presentation about, um, you know, insect diversity in Nebraska, and it was uh, a great opportunity just to talk with people about some of the things we're doing in the state and letting them know about, look, we're in the Great Plains, we've got a really awesome set of insects uh, in the state that, you know, you can just go in your backyard and see a ton of them. So, um, so always talk to people. If you're not comfortable with it, I totally understand that, uh, but work on it because it's going to be a life skill as a biologist. And in fact, recently I was talking, giving a presentation and um, one of the stakeholders in the audience asked me, well, why? Why, why are you going out surveying for this species? And, you know, as biologists, we're like, well, well, why would we not want to? It's just fun. It's fun to do, right? We want to see where these things live. But, but that's not his viewpoint. He's wondering, why are we doing this? And so you've got to be able to take those questions and look at it from someone else's viewpoint, which is not easy to do. It, it's definitely a skill I'm still working on. Um, and it's definitely something that um, I think as biologists, we could all be doing a better job of. So um, I encourage you to work on that. Science communication is, is very, very important. Um, Monica and uh, the folks in the education division, I talk with them all the time about how to make my presentations um, more consumable by uh, the public so that they know what's going on. Um, and so with that, what questions do you guys have for me? I can open it up here and um, I'm willing to answer whatever you've got about schooling or work or being in the field. Do we have some questions in the chat here? Hi, Sean. Um, I do have one, a uh, couple people messaged me. Um, oh, one, okay. Yeah, uh, one person asked, how do you balance um, being in the field and doing like a field biologist job and sometimes having to move around a lot um, when maybe when you first get started and then also like having a family um, or having like a significant other. Um, so how is that, how do you go about balancing your, your personal life and your work life? Yeah, so that's a, that's a good question. I, um, so I'm very lucky. My, uh, my spouse, my wife is actually a biologist as well. Um, she's a prairie ecologist um, and works uh, for the University of Nebraska here in Lincoln. And we have been uh, very lucky that we have been able to find jobs uh, in the same city, um, which isn't always possible when um, you have two biologists. So uh, we have been very lucky doing that. But uh, I'm also very lucky in that she understands the field component um, that uh, that happens. And so um, she may be going out collecting uh, plants for a couple of days. And so um, I understand that I'm able to take care of the kids and
Sorry, Sean. I think you got on mute somehow. I did. I'm sorry. What was the last thing you heard? Um, kind of balancing between like your wife having a job at the university. And yeah. Yeah. And so, um, so it's good that, um, you know, we can, we can kind of balance things that uh, she knows what's going on. Uh, if I've got to go out and do surveys, um, you know, she can take care of our girls. And uh, if she's got to go out collecting for a couple of days, then I've got the girls. And uh, what's really nice about having two biologists is we understand the field component. Um, and it, it's not always easy. There is some balancing to that. Um, and certainly when, um, when we were first getting going, there was certainly more travel uh, that we were able to do, but now I'm in a position where I can plan things a little bit better since I'm doing the planning. So, um, but every, every situation is different, but it, planning is key. So taking the time, looking in the future to see what you can get done, I think is, is a big help. Uh, Sean, it looks like someone in the chat asked, how long does it take to become a biologist? Uh, you know, it, it, it depends. What's your definition of a biologist? But um, I mean, there are uh, people that are working your standard, you know, wildlife biologist jobs um, with a bachelor's degree, um, you know, and so that's typically a four-year degree. You could probably get um, some conservation technicians, which are like biologists, um, and you could probably do that with, with an associate's degree. So, uh, you know, two to four years of uh, formal education, but then you definitely want a couple of years of, of field work and or just working outside with um, other biologists um, uh, as, as part of that. And I certainly jumped around. I did a lot of different jobs um, while from the time I graduated my undergrad to now. Um, I certainly worked a lot of jobs and not all of them were in biology. Oh, you're muted. Oh, Thanks, Sean. Um, do you want to maybe unshare your screen? And then if people would like to, um, I did able to unmute people. So if you would like to type your question in the chat, you're more than welcome to. Um, or if you would like to unmute yourself and also ask a question. But we did have another person in the chat. Um, they mentioned that they are closing in on 50. They want a career change. Uh, they are currently in journalism. Would you say this is an impossible idea if they did decide they want to become a biologist at this point? Oh, no, I would, I would say absolutely not. Um, you know, there's um, different ways you can certainly go about it. Um, if you're in Nebraska, you know, um, Nebraska as well as other states have a master naturalist program. Um, that's a good way to get started, to get some experience under your belt. Uh, and then also you can, you know, you can certainly go back to school, uh, get some classes and, um, you know, get out there and, and start looking for jobs. You know, Game and Parks has a lot of seasonal positions that you can apply for. And um, uh, we take all sorts of folks in there to get them experience. And a lot of them we end up hiring in the long run. I was one of those temporaries. I worked as a temporary for uh, about three years uh, before I got a job. And, and some people do it a lot longer than that. So um, there's certainly opportunities. Awesome. And for those of you that are interested, I did put that Nebraska Master, La Master Naturalist website in the chat. Um, I. Do you know if other states have something like that, Sean, or is that like a Nebraska thing? No, there are certainly other states that do it. Um, there's naturalists, there's like gardening ones, there's, um, yeah, different states have different programs, but definitely check your state and see what they have. Awesome, thank you. Um, uh -huh. Someone also asked, um, do you go up to the animals and study them? Uh, sometimes, yeah. Um, so it kind of depends on what we're doing. I prefer not to interact with the animals as much as possible. We certainly take a hands-off approach because uh, as soon as you put hands on a, an animal or capture it, um, you're certainly adding stress to that uh, animal. Uh, and so we try not to do that. Um, we use binoculars a lot or other ways of uh, camera traps, things like that. Uh, where we're not uh, causing harm or stress to the animal as much as possible. Um, but if we do need to do something like uh, get a hair sample, tissue sample, if we need to collar an animal or we need to mark an animal, uh, then certainly we've got to uh, get hands on them. Uh, but otherwise, we do try to keep our distance. 
Yeah, definitely. Uh, someone else also asked, um, did you have any mentors or um, a mentor when you started? Uh, I've had several mentors across the years that have uh, really helped me out. Um, uh, you know, my, my undergrad advisors, uh, John Hess, uh, Cheryl Schmidt uh, was one that uh, I helped out quite a bit with. Um, Luke Dollar uh, was another one. Um, my graduate advisor, uh, Rob Channel, uh, all of these people were, were very, very helpful. Um, Greg Farley, uh, a lot of them were, were very helpful in, in kind of um, helping me get to where I need to go to. Um, and then also, you know, there's, there's mentors and then there's also, you know, what we call professional mentors, um, you know, when you actually get into a job. Um, and I've had several of those too. Uh, Roger Wolf down in Kansas was a huge help in, in helping me get set up uh, here in Nebraska. Scott Ludke um, was uh, a big help for me for, for many years in, in helping me get to where I want to go. Um, Tammy Snyder was very helpful. So yeah, I mean, there, there, are, there are certainly people that reach out and, and help you when, um, when they can. And uh, if you find those people, um, it's great. Um, really learn whatever you can from them. All right. And then someone else also asked a little bit earlier, um, what advice would you have for someone who wants to work in the field that has a BS in biology with undergraduate research experience, but most of their experience is in the animal care field with a little bit of field experience? Yeah. So the, the best thing you can start doing, um, you know, it, it kind of depends on what your ultimate goal is, but um, try to get some more field experience by volunteering. Um, you know, if you are uh, wanting to get a graduate degree, certainly looking at the university, talking to the professors there, they've always got research uh, programs going on. Um, but also there are a lot of job boards for um, field research, like the Texas A&M job board. Um, and then some, I think, um, uh, biodiversity, oh, there's another one. Society for Conservation Biology, I think, has a job board. But look on those, and they have um, uh, field, they have field experience where you can go out and be a field assistant for a summer or for a couple of months, sometimes a year. And sometimes it gets, um, I mean, they're really exotic. Uh, sometimes they're here in the States, um, but there's, there's a lot of really good um, potential there for you. Yeah, absolutely. And for those of you interested, the Texas A&M one that uh, Sean had mentioned, I put that uh, name just in the chat there. If you just Google Texas A&M job board, it will come up. And like you said, you can look for part-time, full-time, um, assistantships, undergrad, everything is there. So. Uh, Sean, someone also asked us um, if you were to hire someone, um, and I know you do like some helpers and stuff like that, what do you really look for when you want to hire someone um, being in this field? What stands out? Uh, you know, someone that obviously has the background that shows that they're, they're definitely interested and they have some experience, um, uh, you know, you know, you want a good combo of, you know, your education that you've gone through the basic classes. So, you know what we're doing, you understand that. Uh, but then someone also that is dependable, someone's going to show up, they're going to be there, they're going to do uh, what you ask them to do. Um, that's one of the biggest things, because uh, as I said, working in the field isn't always easy. Um, and so having someone that's really dependable uh, is, is really helpful. I got, I think one of the things I, I can't remember if I mentioned this earlier, but, you know, I got really good at, at following directions. Um, and no matter what it was, I do it. And, um, and, and people remember that they're like, Oh, okay. Yeah. It, even if you're standing in three foot of mud, you know, he'll sit there and take notes for you. So, um, you know, whatever it is, be really good at following directions and, um, be dependable. Uh, you know, be there when you say you're going to, um, and and your uh, uh, references will say that, and your experience will show. 
that is really good. I would look for that too if I was going to hire someone as well. So um, does anyone have any questions or anything you would like to either type in the chat or unmute yourself and ask Sean? Um, otherwise, we are kind of coming up on that 50 minute mark and I want to make sure that Sean has other stuff to do and we have stuff as well. So um, if no one else has any questions, Sean, I think you made some really good points. Um, one of the things that I really like that you mentioned at the very beginning of your presentation is that we don't necessarily have to focus on one taxa if you want to be a biologist. Um, I'm also a huge herp person and you don't have to focus on just one of those. You can be a little bit of a not an expert, I guess, but a little bit of an expert in every single one of those. You don't have to focus on just one thing. So um, yeah, anything else that you would like to add? Any last minute things that you would like to tell anyone that would maybe want to be a zoologist? Um, no, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting because I was always frustrated that, um, you know, I, I like so many different taxa, you know, like I said, I was so interested in herps and then I was so interested in birds and then uh, mammals and insects. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm very, very lucky to, to be in the position I am and, and I'm not an expert in just about anything, but um, I, I certainly uh, enjoy what I do. I love my job. It's my dream job. And uh, I'm just, I'm happy to be here. So keep pushing at what you're doing. And even if you're unsure, just keep moving forward, um, you know, work with whatever you can, um, because in the end, uh, all of that hard work will pay off, so. Awesome. Um, anyone at the last moment wanna ask any questions? Otherwise, I'm gonna go ahead and sign off here um, and let okay. Sean go. Um, any other questions? Going once, going twice. All right, well, thank you very much, Sean, for joining us today. Um, I really yeah. appreciate you talking. This was some great information. I think people um, learned a lot and had some good questions as well, so. Great, well, thank you guys, appreciate it. Yeah, and if any of you missed this or would like to um, have, a, have a friend see this or watch it again, it will be available on our Nebraska Game and Parks Education YouTube channel. It'll be probably posted by end of the day today or probably tomorrow. Um, and then next month on March 17th, we will have um, an aquatic invasive species uh, program manager joining us and talking about very similar to this, uh, what he does, his background, his education, that kind of stuff. So please go ahead and look for that and uh, join us next month on the 17th. So thank you again, Sean. We appreciate it. Yeah. Great information. Thank you. Thank you.